there's a growing idea that I think is very dangerous in Christianity, and that is this whole concept of you have to defend yourself, that you have to arm yourself, that you have to go out and get all these tools to protect yourself, because after all, God helps those who help themselves, right? Now, I know some of you that know the Bible are already cringing at that statement, because there are lots of people out there that honestly think that God helps those who help themselves is a scripture. And to those that think that, I can only tell you, Google it. I think you'll find that a lot of things people believe about the Bible isn't necessarily in the Bible. Sometimes people add things to the Bible. Sometimes they take out from it ideas about the Bible. Now, that's all good and well and said and done, because irregardless of whether it's in scripture or not, you're still talking about a principle. But the principle that you're saying is that God will help you if you do something. I don't think that's the way God operates. Because you see, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, before we even thought to come to God, God came to us. So somewhere along the way, there's kind of a backwards thinking. We have it backwards when we think we have to defend ourselves or protect ourselves. God is our defense. And if he is, then he doesn't provide for us this arsenal of weaponry that says, hey, you know, I want you to go out and buy, you know, the biggest gun you can get, you know, so you can shoot yourself in the foot or God forbid one of your children shoot you. But rather, God says, I will be your defense. And we see in scripture how every time that man has tried to do it on his own, then the consequences of his actions seem to spiral back onto himself and he winds up suffering the consequence of his own action. Meaning that if he decides to be his own defense and he goes out and becomes violent, he dies by violent means. Look it up. Look and see. If he chooses to trust in the Lord, then his life is all about trust. If he chooses to make God his defense, then God defends him. Elisha is probably the most obstinate, irritating, most ridiculous prophet I have ever seen. Here he is. He goes and he tells his servant, you know, hey, you know what? I don't want to hear you whining about, you know, the Syrians are coming or the Ethiopians are coming or whoever's coming. I just pray God open your eyes and show you the truth. You know, and then he looks out and sees that there are angels standing behind him. Or that, you know, the people come to Elijah and he wipes them out, you know, and he just belligerent faith. You know, and man, shouldn't that be we who are supposed to know the scriptures? Shouldn't that be our attitude? That we could be that so confident of God to protect us? Think about and read about Elisha sometime. It'll blow your mind. Read it in context of the whole life of his life and how he lived it and how he trusted completely in the Lord his God to be his defense and not his own strength of might because he had no strength or not his own power to make friends and influence enemies. No. As a matter of fact, he trusted in the Lord. And isn't that what we should be doing? O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver you? Daniel 6.20 How many times we find this expression in the scriptures, and yet it is just this very thing that we are so prone to lose sight of. Haven't you? Haven't you found yourself in trouble, and the first place you turn to is your bank account? <laughs> or your own idea of how to get out of trouble? Or the first thing out of your mouth was, she did it. <laughs> they did it. He did it. It's their fault, not mine. We know it is written, the living God. 
But in our daily life, there is scarcely anything we practically lose so much sight of as the fact that God is the living God. Repeat that with me. Try it. The living God. <laughs> now, if you're, if you're catching what I'm trying to say is that it's your God alive. In other words, are you serving a living God? Is God, you, you know, you're communicating and talking to him or is he just kind of like, you know, only there for the big things? You know, he's, he's kind of like, you know, well, you know, maybe when you get in enough trouble, I'll, I'll hear. Or maybe when you really have, you know, like dying, I'll, I'll answer. The fact that God is the living God, that he is now whatever he was three or four thousand years since that time, that he has the same sovereign power and the same saving love towards those who love and serve him as he ever had, and that he will do for them now what he did for others two, three, four thousand years ago, simply because he is the living God and he changes not. I really don't even have much more to say about that. It's like I've been talking to people that just keep telling me, well, you know, so-and-so said this about you, or so-and-so did this, and so-and-so did that, and I always say, well, that's okay, I pray for them, you know. I tell God, you know, God, here, you take care of it, you know, it's like, I don't know what their issue is, I don't know what their problem is, you take care of them. And God does. So, why would you choose any other way to go except to turn to God? and let him protect you. We who are living in the land of the living, which we are, ought to know the living God that he wants to reveal his power and be strong on those behalf whose heart is perfect towards him, that we turn to him, that we ask him, that we seek him, that we follow him wherever he goes, whatever he tells us to do. Because then we can trust in his protection. Irregardless of what you see on the outward things, be surprised if you could open your eyes and see what's behind the things you can't see. Be assured if you walk with him and look to him and expect help from him, he will never fail you. An older brother who has known the Lord for 42 years who writes this says to you, for your encouragement that he has never failed him. In the great difficulties and in the heaviest trials and the deepest poverties and necessities, he has never failed me. But because I was enabled by his grace to trust him, he has always appeared for my help. I delight in seeking well of his name. That was George Mueller, as a brother who is one who has been up and down and sideways and left and right and all over for 35 plus years. I can say, yes, I have been in poverty. I have been in severe, extreme hunger in Jerusalem, in Israel, at the end of my rope with no money and no way of finding any food. And God provides. Of course, it was kind of neat because the way he provided for me was that this guy goes walking by with a whole bag of bagels he's getting ready to throw away. <laughs> oh, boy. And I forget if he's throwing them in a dumpster or where he's throwing them, but wherever he threw them, whatever he put them in, he had them in a big bag. And I grabbed the bag and I picked up the bag like Santa Claus and I took off with them. You know, I mean, he wasn't, you know, stealing them. It was thrown in the trash. And so I took them, <laughs> and I ate. <laughs> Man, I ate till I had bagels come out of my ears. It was great. <laughs> and then, because it was one day till Shabbos, it was like, on Shabbos, the certain members of the community in Jerusalem set out cake. You know, special delights for the Shabbos, for the poor people to come and eat. And man, I went walking by this wooden wall and I saw a cake up there and I went, oh. <laughs> and I ate. <laughs> I ate cake. <laughs> Needless to say, eventually God took care of all the reasons of why I was in that predicament. But the circumstances of God always providing for me has always been miraculous and marvelous and just unbelievable. I mean, I have more miracles crawling around my, my experiences in life than most people give credit to God for doing in the Bible, I guess. You know, I mean, to me, it's every day. It's like, wow, you can see all kinds of things happening if you just open your eyes to them. And the more that you give God credit for what he's done, the more he will unveil to you what he's doing. And then you get to watch and see how he's going to come through. That's probably the funnest thing to do is you get into a predicament and you just go, well, Lord, now what are you going to do? <laughs>
Luther was once found at a moment of peril and fear, when he had need to grasp unseen strength, seeing in an abstracted mood, tracing on the wall with his fingers the words, "Vivat! Vivat!" (He lives! He lives!) It is our hope for ourselves and for his truth and for mankind. Men come and go, leaders, teachers, thinkers, speak and work for a season, and then fall silent and impotent. He abides for ever. They die, but he lives. They are lights kindled, and therefore sooner or later are quenched, but he is the true light from which they draw all their brightness, and he shines for ever. From Alexander McGarren One day I came to know Dr. John Douglas Adam, writes C.G. Trumbull. I learned from him that he counted his greatest spiritual asset was his unvarying consciousness of the actual presence of Jesus. Nothing bore him up so, he said, as the realization that Jesus was always with him in actual presence, and that this was so independent of his own feelings and independent of his deserts and independent of his own notions as to how Jesus would manifest his presence. He did his own way. Moreover, he said that Christ was the home of his thoughts. Whenever his mind was free from other matters, he would turn to Jesus, and he would talk aloud to Jesus when he was alone, on the street, anywhere, as easily and as naturally as to a human friend. So real to him was Jesus' actual presence. Throughout centuries, in other words, with these recordings that was just read to you from Streams in the Desert, it has been men of God's testimony of factual reality of knowing God in a personal way that they not only spoke to God, they not only trusted in God, but they participated in a very real, very real relationship with Jesus. And you know, you think if you got it down, you know, with Jesus, try talking to your father. You know what I mean? Try talking to spirit. You'd be surprised all the different ways that things can happen in your life and he could expand your thought process in ways you never dreamed of. But the bottom line is you should know that the living God is living and that he protects you. That you don't have to run down and you know fear what men may do. Hey, the gun can jam, the bullet can stop, angels could step forward with fiery swords. Everything you've ever read in the Bible is true. Maybe you don't act like it yet. Maybe you don't know that yet. Maybe you don't see people walking on water. Maybe you haven't been in other countries where you can lay on hands and see limbs restored. Or you can see, well, blind people come to sight. But for me, it was like limbs restored. Like a man with stick legs, you know, suddenly get fat on his legs. That don't happen. <laughs> I don't believe in healing. At least I didn't then until it happened. And I went, uh oh I guess I believe in healing. <laughs> and as a missionary, I mean, it was a shock for me because, frankly, I just didn't want to. I believed healing. Don't get me wrong. I believed in healing that other people did. I never believed that I could lay hands on people and people would be healed. <laughs> and I had no faith to believe it believing. As a matter of fact, I doubted it until the man walked into the church the next day with fully restored limbs. That blew my mind. So... Hey, God does all kinds of neat things, you know, if you're just really going to open up and prove it. I mean, no offense, you take your car out for a test drive, you know, and you check it out to see where all the little doodads and gizmos and gee wizards, you know, are and the gimmicks, you know, to get you to buy their car. Well, frankly, God's got a lot in store for you that you have no idea, no concept, and your mind keeps limiting him from doing what you don't realize you don't need the faith to do. You just need to open your eyes, <laughs> frankly, and your ears to what he is doing already. And then just go ask him to show you. Talk to him personally. He loves you. That's why you should know him intimately. And the more you know him intimately, whew, you think sci-fi is fun to watch on TV. Wait till you see it in real life. It's spooky. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's different. I mean, I'll be honest. You know, I was one time walking to a church service, you know, and 
Well, <laughs> I was just thinking about it. I'm still like, ooh, it was like, whoa. And I walked in, you know, and it was like Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, believers meeting, you know. People don't realize that we used to have believers meetings, you know, and things, you know, went on pretty crazy. You know, I mean, not rolling around on the floor barking. I mean, that's stupid. No, I mean, like, really things of the Spirit and like, wow. You know, and man, imagine tripping out, you know, and one day just flying to heaven, you know, just looking back and sensing your body's back there, but you don't want to look back because what's looking forward is so wonderful that you can't express the joy that you feel as you're pursuing forward, but you know in your mind's eye you can see your body back there down below and you're not in it. Move over, astral projection. Watch out, Zen. Here we come. Do it again. <laughs> I mean, they got nothing on being a Christian. Man, all kinds of things God has done. Whether in the body or out of the body, you can experience so much more than you've ever dreamed of that your Father wants to show you. And then when He does, you'll just... You won't brag. You won't brag. You won't talk that much about it either. But you know what? You just fall in love with your father so much more. You'll know your God in such an intimate way that nothing will ever be able to take Jesus away from you. Nothing will ever be able to separate you from the love of God, of him, the love of God that is in Jesus that you have inside you because you'll always love him. You may feel saddened sometimes that you've disappointed or failed in your own estimation. But man, when you've experienced God to that degree, and it's not because you're great, and you, you're humbled by it, if anything. And you'll just be thrilled to death that you can call upon the name of the Lord and you know you're saved. And when you're in trouble, when you're in trouble, you can just trust in the Lord and He will deliver you. Thank you.